Today's episode is sponsored by Gremlin. Gremlin's chaos engineering platform lets you intentionally inject failure into your system to find weaknesses before they cause problems for your users. Use Gremlin for free at gremlin.com forward slash free. Hello and welcome to the InfoQ podcast. My name is Wes Rice and I'm your host. Today on the show, we're chatting with Rod Johnson, aka SpringRod. Rod Johnson created the Spring Framework, co-founded SpringSource, and following the acquisition of SpringSource by VMware, he was the SVP, Senior Vice President of Application Platform at VMware from 2009 to 2012. In 2015, after a short sabbatical, he founded Atomist, a company working on automations and integrations for developers, changing how software is delivered and how the flow of software is delivered. We'll talk a bit about that. He remains as the CEO there today. In addition to the CEO of Atomist, he's on the board for Neo, for Meteor, for Hazelcast. So he knows a lot about the software we're building and using today. On the show today, Rod and I discuss some of the early origins of Spring, the Spring framework. We'll talk a bit about languages post-Java. We'll talk about Scala and we'll talk about TypeScript and we'll talk about Atomist and some of the ways that Atomist is working to help developers change the delivery cycle. As always, thanks for taking us along on your runs, walks, and commutes. Rod, welcome to the show. Hi, Wes. Great to talk to you. We were talking right before this. I was like, I feel like I've known you for a long time, but I've never actually had a conversation with you. You know so much about what I've done. It's, have you been stalking me? Yeah, there's a few million of us out there that know a little bit about the work that you've done. <laughs> Let's start off at the beginning, at least for me. Spring Framework started with this book that you first wrote a few years back, Expert One-on-One, J2EE. I haven't said that in a long time. Design and Development. Is that right? That is right. And I'm going to give you marks for getting the full name of that book right because <laughs> like, nobody says the full name of that book. <laughs> they remember because of the slightly odd cover picture with the rather strange position that the photographer persuaded me to adopt. Okay. So what came first? The idea for the code to deliver the book or the book? There's something like 10,000 lines, 30,000 lines of code for that book, right? 30,000 lines. And I would really say to everybody out there, don't do what I did. Do not try (laughs) this at home. Like writing a 700 page book is a lot of work. If that, you know, just isn't enough, you need to write tens of thousands of lines of code. So that was a very intense process. Basically, what happened was I had quite a lot of experience as an enterprise Java architect before. And I had started off really enthusiastic about J2EE and EJB. And in attempting to apply it in the real world, I discovered that it really didn't work that well. So I set out writing that book in the hope of writing a really good book on J2EE and why J2EE is great and how you should use it. And I discovered during the process of writing the book that I didn't believe anymore. So like when I'd start writing the sample application, I'd realize, oh my God, this is absurdly complex for the functionality we're actually delivering here. So the process, it took me, I think, 13 months elapsed time to write that book with probably a couple of months of consultancy here and there to recharge my bank account. And during that process, I arrived at a very different view on J2EE. And basically, I arrived at the view that you know, EJB was not a great technology. And I wrote a framework that introduced the core ideas of Spring. So basically, the whole dependency injection thing was there. The um, simplification around JDBC, the emphasis on unchecked exceptions, all those things were in the first framework. And so I had no idea that people would actually want to run this for real. I thought they'd find it an interesting illustration. And then Jürgen Hurler and a number of other people came along, really wanted to use it, persuaded me to open source it. Jürgen stepped up and is an absolutely amazing engineer. He continues to lead Spring to this day and his contribution was incredible. And, you know, that really helped it take off. In the book, you called it Interface 21 Framework, right? Yes, that was the original name for SpringSource. We actually changed our name, I think, three years into the history of the company. I guess it was, I was thinking about the 21st century because I actually registered that name, I think, back in 97 or something. And secondly, interface, like, I think anyone who's worked with code that I've written knows my deep love of interfaces, deeply imbibe the gang of four advice to program to interfaces rather than classes. 
So the name didn't stick, but I thought it was funny at the time. Spring became the following the winner of JTWE, is that right? Yes, that name was suggested by a community member called Jan Karoff. I think Jan was from Luxembourg. He eventually decided to focus on his girlfriend and playing bass in a band rather than contribute further to open source, which is, I get it. It's like, you know, having a life is a good thing. But anyway, Jan was really involved at the beginning. He played a huge role in encouraging me to open source it. He also came up with a name because, as you can tell from Interface 21, I suck at naming things. So, yeah, it's actually kind of sad, I think, that people don't really know about Jan's contribution because he really did play a very important role. And then what, by 2005, there was something like half a million, 400,000 downloads of Spring Framework? Oh, by 2005, probably about 2 million, I think. I think we got over a million in the first year. So the framework itself became open source, I think, in February 2003. And we we would have passed the million download mark probably early 2004. What was the next big addition to Spring? Was that Aspects with Adrian Coyier? So basically, after the open source, Jürgen focused on adding more data and transaction features like the Hibernate integration. I focused on AOP and you know delivering things like the clarity of transaction management. And I spent a good part of 2003 trying to get that right. And then Adrian came along later and we integrated it with the Aspect J model and we really got it right. But yeah, we'd already established what we called the spring triangle. So dependency injection, AOP and portable service abstractions. That was well established by the end of 2003. That sounds familiar. Something like three pillars that we might be talking about in a little bit. It seems like a common theme that we're coming back to. <laughs> Not to get ahead of myself here. Okay, so then 2006, it was a million. No, you said a million downloads in the first year, right? Oh, yeah. 2006, I don't know what the number was, but it would have been way into the millions. My numbers are way off that I wrote down here. So 2008 is when Spring Source came along. So you raised your Series B then. CG came along and joined Spring. Yeah, so we founded the company in mid-2004. It was myself and the other core framework developers. And we operated, we were bootstrapped for nearly three years, raised our Series A in 2007. We rebranded the company Spring Source in 2008, but it was the same company. Yeah, Ben Alex joined along the way. Ben was the creator of ACG Security, which later became Spring Security. Ben actually is also Australian. He lives about a mile from where I live now. Nice, nice. And then 2009 is when VMware acquired Spring Source. What was that like? Ultimately, it was good, but it was very painful along the way. So I felt really good about the acquisition, partly because, I mean, VMware were extremely generous to our engineers. So, like, I mean, from that point of view, it was a wonderful outcome. And, you know, I was very concerned about the fact that it was a wonderful outcome, not just for our shareholders and founders, but it was a wonderful outcome, really, way down the team. And I felt really good about that. I had tremendous admiration for Paul Moretz, the CEO of VMware at that time. Paul is one of the smartest people I've ever met. He's a tremendous visionary. So Paul saw it. Paul saw that putting the lower level deployment technology like VMware with the way people wanted to build apps was a really, really powerful thing. It is what powers Pivotal's business today substantially. So Paul was 100% right on the vision and I really enjoyed working with him. Unfortunately, for the first couple of years, the execution was substantially affected by internal politics. And I'm not going to go into the details. I think most of us have worked for large companies. We know what it's like. So there was a couple of years where, frankly, that promise just didn't come to fruition because of execution and political struggles. But, you know, it's been great to see that Pivotal have fully embraced Spring. Pivotal get it with respect to Spring and how important it is. So, you know, that's ultimately, I think it's it's turned out to be a good acquisition. Yeah, I literally just talked to Joe Beta a few weeks ago and just purchased Heptio as well. So they seem to still be keeping a good pace with the pulse, I guess. Okay, so you left 2012. Any comment or thoughts on when you left? 
I think it was just the politics had really gotten to me. Look, there were specific frustrations at that time around individuals who later left or got fired. So fortunately, you know, those things don't apply and hopefully won't affect Joe. Look, there's a lot to like about VMware. I mean, it is a great company and it's achieved some fantastic things. So yeah, I guess it was it was two things. Firstly, the you know, big company politics is not my thing. And secondly, I'm just more a entrepreneurial startup kind of guy. That's just more exciting to me. I remember about that time there was a blog post or something I read or something that was talking about you now using Scala. What was that all about? <laughs> By the time I left VMware, I probably hadn't written much code for probably at least three years. So I was doing the kind of things that executives do, which doesn't involve writing that much code. I mean, by the time I left VMware, I was carrying a MacBook Air. I mean, you can't write Scala on a MacBook Air. So I decided that I wanted to look at what was out there, what was hot and what was interesting, and that I wasn't necessarily just going to, you know, continue in the spring world. I was just going to look at other things. So I found Scala really interesting, quickly fell in love with the language and spent probably two or three years predominantly writing in Scala. Okay, but why Scala? Why not JRuby or Groovy? Both of those were pretty popular about the same time. There are many things I love about Scala. There are also many things in Scala. And that's a problem with Scala. So, you know, I mean, I think that over time I started to realize some of the negatives that people say about Scala are actually real. But I absolutely love the elegance. For example, the fact that anything in Scala is an expression, like, you know, a curly brace block, that's an expression. Like once you've seen that and how glorious and elegant it is, it's really hard to live without it. And of course, you know, pretty much any other C family language doesn't have that. So there are certainly things in Scala that I think are absolutely beautiful. But the problem is I think Scala tends to have a fairly academic crowd and there tends to be a lot of like people who want to take Scala in a very functional direction, which I'm not sure sits that well with the language. And also, there does seem to be a great joy in taking very complex approaches to things. Like, I don't think there's a lot of pragmatism in that community, and that started to bother me. One of the things that really bothered me was that in the Scala community, people hate Java libraries. And I mean, one of the beautiful things about Scala is you can take just about any Java library and you can put a Scala wrapper over it that will be very thin that will make it much nicer to use than it was in Java. Problem is, that's not what people do. They assume that because they're Scala developers, they're smarter than any Java developer who ever lived. So they write a hopelessly buggy library that's got like, you know, 1% of the usage experience of the Java thing. And, you know, they all converge on things like that. There's the spring rod we know. (laughs) So, for example, it would really, like, I saw a number of things that did transaction management. And, like, of course, nobody in Scala wants to use Spring because Spring's old school. And I would just have to hold my head when I'd read some of this code and think, you know, we work through the things you haven't yet found, we work through in 2005. Like, there are these crazy edge cases with buggy products. Like, you know, that is what getting a transaction abstraction right involves and implementing it. So, yeah, I found I kind of found that frustrating. I think if Scala, the Scala community had emphasized playing really nicely with Java, it would have been a way better for everyone. And I think that has been a missed opportunity. So today you're using TypeScript. What led you down the road to TypeScript? We got into TypeScript from at Atomist realizing that Node was actually the best runtime for a particular part of our product. And our programming model that we would expose to users should be based on Node. Pretty much my entire career, I've been convinced of the benefits of strongly typed languages. So therefore, TypeScript was very attractive versus JavaScript. And I absolutely love TypeScript. I would say that of any language I've programmed in, it is my favorite. Wow, that's a strong statement. Tell me more. I mean, obviously, types writing Node is super useful, but what makes you love TypeScript so much? 
I think with TypeScript, the whole notion of an extra layer of typing over a dynamic language actually works remarkably well. So, you know, if you look at the type system in TypeScript, it's significantly more sophisticated than the Java TypeScript system. In fairness to Java, everything tends to work predictably in Java. You can get like some weirdness showing through from the JavaScript in TypeScript. Like, for example, don't even talk about this. But, you know, fundamentally, it's got a stronger type system than Java. But also, you can just opt out of the type system, right? If you want to opt out of the type system in Java or Scala, and in the guts of things like Spring, you're doing that all over the place for that kind of framework style code, you have to use reflection. And it's you know fairly clunky and unreadable in the implementation of it. Whereas in TypeScript, you just basically drop to JavaScript. And that actually works really, really well, I find. I think there's a number of clever things in TypeScript, like type guards work really well. It's also obviously a more modern language than Java in terms of, you know, having interpolated strings, not having to duplicate, you know, fields in so many places, all those kind of things. I also like the fact that functions are first class citizens, obviously, in JavaScript and TypeScript. That actually does make a bit of a difference to in Scala. Obviously, Scala in some ways is more capable as a functional language than TypeScript. But in Scala, you've got to put a function on an object. It's not quite as native. There's something beautiful about just being able to write native functions. You use TypeScript with this company, Atomus, that you founded. What was the idea with the Atomus? You started in 2015, I guess? Yeah, so Atomus is based around trying to rethink delivery for the cloud native generation. I think how we've traditionally done delivery, CI and CD, doesn't really handle modern cloud native projects that well. So obviously, the whole concept of CI was a tremendous advantage for advance for the industry. But there hasn't been a lot of innovation since it first emerged. So typically, for example, in every one of our projects, it'll have its own build pipeline, probably defined in YAML or some other kind of DSL. And that was fine when, say, a line of business had five, five million line applications. That was fine. Like every five million line application is special, right? You don't think about duplication between those pipelines because all of those applications have unique requirements. So roll the clock forward and now you're looking at people having hundreds of much smaller applications. I mean, this tendent trend in the enterprise towards microservices or whatever you call it, right? People are fragmenting their applications into much more fine-grained services, and every company on earth is doing that to some extent. So suddenly, you don't have five YAML-defined pipelines anymore. You have 500. And the problems with that, I think, are fairly obvious. How do you consistently apply change across all of those things? So people, I think, are really drowning in duplication because these concepts you know, don't translate well to modern requirements. So that was one of the first motivations for Atomist. What, what should delivery look like if you think about a cloud native world. Okay, but what does that look like? I mean, at the still basic level, you're still taking some code, packaging it up into a container or something along those lines, managing dependencies and deploying it. Is it that you're orchestrating the deployments? What does it mean to be rethinking the deployment pipeline for cloud native architecture? So essentially, we change from a model where you've got a statically defined deployment pipeline probably in every repository. We rethink that and you end up with an event hub. So a push, a build, a deployment, all these things surfaces events. And Atomist allows you to have event handling policies. So, for example, you can change how pushes can be handled across your entire organization in one place. That's a slight oversimplification. Sometimes people choose to break out particular concerns like security. But what people want is a very small number of places. They don't want 500 places. Nobody wants 500 places. What I heard is you have something like an event source that you're listening for different events that will trigger different actions. Exactly. So if you think about the model of a push as an event, what we do at Atomist is when we see a push, the first thing we do is schedule what we call goals. So we dynamically compute based on what we call push rules, 
what should happen for this push? So, for example, we can look inside the repository and we can say, oh, this one is a Spring Boot repo. We know how to apply SonarCube to Java code. So we're going to firstly do a SonarCube scan. This one has a cube spec in it. So we know how to deploy that to one of our Kubernetes clusters. Or alternatively, this is a node project that actually has a AWS SAM file in it. We know how to deploy these things to Lambda. So essentially, the push rules determine what should happen for each push. They then set a number of goals. And thereafter, basically, we manage a workflow where you know the infrastructure will try to achieve those goals. So there are essentially three things that are different from what people may be familiar with in CICD. Firstly, there's this model of an event hub rather than multiple statically defined pipelines. Secondly, as you can tell when I'm talking about push rules, there is a rich model. So when we handle that event, we have access to things like we can look inside the code. We can see what files were changed, were they significant, what kind of repository is it, who made that push. All these kind of things are available through our model. And thirdly, we don't use YAML or an external DSL. We take the view that the best way to express this kind of behavior is in code. And this is where we get back to TypeScript. So, you know, we basically want to provide a framework that enables you to implement these goals, as we call them, in TypeScript. So, for example, if you want to set up your push rules, you use an internal DSL in TypeScript to do that. There's a quote you said, today we have API for hardware, but we need an API for software so that we can develop our own development experience. What does that mean? So I think one of the great things that's happened over the last 10 or 15 years is we've really got an API for just about everything, right? I mean, there's an API for your car, there's an API for your fridge. I don't know if you've watched Silicon Valley. You know what you can do with an API for a fridge? Absolutely. Watching Silicon Valley is kind of table stakes today for a software developer, no? (laughs) There's also increasingly an API for hardware. So, you know, 15 years ago, you wanted a new server, you probably got a forklift. VMware was just starting to change that and virtualization was really the first wave. Now, it's inconceivable that your route to deploy new services to ask for a forklift, right? You're going to spin up a cluster, put it on an existing cluster, you're going to use Docker or Kubernetes or Cloud Foundry or AWS Lambda or something that has an API. And I think that we haven't really internalized the incredible importance of that. If everything has an API, the best way to work with it is using programming languages. These programming languages are awesome. So therefore, you want to extend the range of things that you can do with your TypeScript, JavaScript, you know, your full-featured programming languages. And then you get awesome tooling support, you get modularity, you get loads of libraries. So basically, for me, that was kind of a light bulb moment, which is well, if everything has an API, wouldn't you want to program your delivery? It's like, you know, if the business asks us to deliver a business application, we don't go back to them and say, yeah, I could just about do that with YAML and a few bash scripts, right? We engineer something that's testable, that uses all these amazing computer science concepts that generations of people have developed. So yeah, it's a magic of code. I've always believed in the magic of code. There's also this idea of the software delivery machine. Is that just the notion of the collection of event handlers, the listeners that are responding to the stream of events? Is that? Yep, you got it exactly right. So originally, it very much did look like a collection of event handlers, and it was pretty low level. So originally, it was analogous, say, in the Java world to the servlet API. Right, you can implement this API that will enable you to handle events, but you you don't really get any framework or any great help with it. So what we did was discover we needed the spring boot of that. And that is the software delivery machine. So the software delivery machine makes it really easy to add handlers with a little bit more structure. So, you know, the kind of handlers 
that you need 95% of the time. Have a specific API that's strongly typed, really easy to work with. So yeah, it's more like think about if the servlet API is the underlying automation client API, as we call it, the um, software delivery machine is like Spring MVC and Spring Boot. Yep. Uh, it's something that's really focused on the kind of things you probably want to do and makes them really easy. You're involved in something called the Software Delivery Manifesto. How does all this relate to this, this document? So essentially, that was a group of people who had a shared vision around that idea of doing it in code, right? Just what I said, where essentially you want to apply modern engineering principles like event sourcing, but also the power of modern languages to being able to develop your delivery. So that document was produced probably in November. There were a number of people, a few people from Pivotal, a few individuals, Mick Kirsten from Tasktop, Kenny Bastani from Pivotal, you can blame for the name if you find it difficult to say. And basically, yeah, we realized that we had a shared view around a take on delivery that means you can apply your core engineering skills to your daily work. So, you know, that's the core idea. It's like our superpower as developers is that, you know, in the Harry Potter world, they have spells. We kind of have spells as well. Our spells actually affect things. They can even now affect hardware. So, you know, we've got this marvelous ability to cast spells and we should apply that ability not just to the apps we deliver, but to our own daily work. So, for example, of how our software is delivered. Also, things like, for example, if we create new projects, can we automate all the steps, like raising tickets in different systems, notifying people that they need to care and feed for this new app, all those kind of things. Can we automate those things using our core magical power. Absolutely. What is it that Frederick Brooks Jr. said in the Mythical Man Month? Something like, the programmer, like the poet, works only slightly removed from pure thought stuff. They build castles in the air from air. One types the correct incantation on a keyboard and a display comes to life. Something like that. Okay, so we started off talking about Spring. So what's the relationship of some of the work that you're doing now with Atomus and the work you did with Spring for many years? Well, there's a couple of relationships. The most important is that I think we're reflecting a lot of the lessons that we learned from Spring. So in terms of Atomist, there are really two fundamental parts of our product. There is the service where it sits in the cloud ingesting events. So that provides stable webhooks for GitHub, GitHub Enterprise, GitLab, Bitbucket, various build tools, deployments, etc. And it basically maintains a database where we're constantly correlating incoming events with everything we know, which gives us, for example, a system of record from a particular commit through to production. So that service exposes the events in GraphQL and can support subscribers over secure WebSockets. For the language geeks out there, by the way, that is written overwhelmingly in Clojure. So our backend team, teams are big Clojure fans. The client side, which is where you define your push rules and how delivery actually happens and which handles the events, is in the form of node apps, hopefully written in TypeScript. That is the area in which I personally work, and I've written an absolute ton of code in the last couple of years, and I enjoy it very much. And that is where I think we've been able to apply a lot of the lessons from Spring. So it's this idea of building a framework that will be extensible, but nevertheless, fairly easy to use. So, you know, the core people in designing those APIs and the experience have been myself, Christian Dupas, who was also a core Spring engineer, and Jessica. And, you know, I think we've applied a lot of the learnings from Spring. You've got these millions of events since 2015 that have been generated from Atomist on how developers deliver and push software. What kind of insights are you able to glean on what developers look like pushing software? Yeah, I mean, look, I think there is definitely something to be done there. Like one of the obvious insights is we can see trends in terms of build performance like right we can see if something is degrading over time we can see trends in terms of proportion of successful deployments or builds 
time taken, those kind of things. I think we have barely scratched the surface in what we can do with that data. And I mean, one thing, of course, that we really want to be really respectful of is ensure that, you know, we're not doing anything creepy or anything with people's data they wouldn't intend. I do think, for example, there might be some interesting things to be done with anonymized data where we could present our customers with insights like, you know, you're out of whack with the average of everyone else for this metric. I don't know what's happening, but you're out of whack and you're getting more out of whack. So, yeah. Like, I mean, currently the majority of our paying customers are large enterprises. And, of course, with a large enterprise, it's really more their data that's interesting to them because they're just always going to be somewhat different. One of the things that I always found curious about Atomus is you seem to really be committed to actually deploying and developing inside of Slack where people can actually use Slack to be able to interface with Atomus software. Why is that? We heard that a lot of teams basically live in Slack. So, I mean, we do ourselves. And there are some really, really nice things about Slack from this point of view. The biggest thing I think is that you have natural communities of interest. Like if I'm interested in one of our internal projects, I join the channel. If I decide it's not interesting to me, I leave the channel. It's a perfect way of allowing people to shape what they need to follow and ensure they only get relevant messages. So Slack has always been one of our primary interfaces. We also now support Microsoft Teams, which is becoming quite popular, particularly in enterprises. We also have a web interface. But we do find that the Slack integration is a very popular feature of our product. It enables you to follow what's happening in your delivery in Slack. It enables you to implement Slack commands, spot commands very, very easily. And you can implement them in a way that they can access your code. So for example, if there's a repository associated with a particular channel, you can write a command that, for example, will perform an update or transformation on the code in that repository. And I think one of the interesting and differentiated things is that we enable you not just to observe, but to make changes to the world through Slack. And that's where I think what we have is superior to combining various point integrations of products like GitHub or Jenkins or whatever. We give you one really elegant, focused view of what's happening. So if I want to go out and use Atomus's, it's enterprise as far as I know. Is there anything that I can use to get my hands on it, a freemium version or anything? There's two things you can do. The first thing is you can use our open source. So if you install the Atomist CLI, you can run Atomist on your own machine and that's all open source. It obviously doesn't have the persistent database in the sky. So, you know, it doesn't benefit from all the correlation features, but, you know, most of the delivery features are fully available in that. And it also means you can explore the programming model purely in open source. We are currently allowing people to set up their workspace. We'll be announcing a freemium tier. So, I mean, it's certainly, it is not our goal to try to make money out of individual developers. I mean, currently our customer base, paying customer base is like almost exclusively large enterprise. We really see ourselves being able to provide something like, say, GitHub, where for the vast majority of individual developers, they don't. They don't need to pay us and they have access to the core benefits. Well, Ride, like I said, it feels like I've, I've known you for years. It's awesome to have a chance to chat with you for a few minutes. So thanks for taking the time. Great. Thank you, Wes. Thank you.